The Library by Francis Rosenfeld Third Scene When Gwen was awakened by the chill of the desert night, she found herself in an empty house, dead quiet except for the eerie clinking of the bead curtains. The quiet of the desert reaches beyond silence. It preempts the emergence of sounds, like an unechoic chamber. In the desert, one only hears two things, the wind and total silence. She tried to go back to sleep, but her three nights in the desert had conditioned her to a different sleeping schedule. The empty house felt creepy at night, with no light and no sound, almost like a tomb. She wondered where they went, irrationally afraid they'd abandoned her to her fate and weren't coming back, and the thought, accompanied by a vigorous, will-defying, unlearned and neurotransmitter-fueled fear response prompted her to get out of the house. She saw them from the doorway, in the valley below, in the wider frame of a sterile landscape that looked like a postcard from Mars, sitting around the campfire and indulging the occasional puff, accompanied by the clear liquid from several half-empty jars, which, she had no doubt, did not contain water. One of them saw her standing in the doorway and gestured broadly towards her to come over. Join us, the man, who turned out to be number three, encouraged Gwen to sit down by the campfire, and the entire group reshuffled to make room for her. We're debating meaning. Gwen blinked. So, what do you think? Number eight prodded her. Ah, uh, I don't know. Oh, so... What you are saying is meaning is something that should be given you, a priori, or by a superior entity, and that's not something you can conjure for yourself from your context. That's not what you meant. The laughter resumed briefly, but got cut short so the group could return to the subject of the debate, which it found more interesting. I surmise meaning is intended, whether its recipient or conveyor is aware of it or not. Monkeys on typewriters can create meaning, they just don't understand it. The sea, if it deposits a fully written piece of articulate language on a beach, conveys the meaning of a purposeful intent. Whose? That isn't the question. We don't know whose. We asked whether the meaning of that piece of writing exists. It's a completely different matter. Oh, so you're saying every time I stub my toe and express my displeasure in salty language, I'm lending the contents of my noggin to the workings of a superior power so it can gift the world with meaning. What makes you think it's you who stabbed your toe? What makes you think you have willful control over stabbing or not stabbing your toe? That would make me a programmable machine. I thought that track was abandoned in the 80s. You are programmable, my dear friend. It's just that the mass of soft circuits between your ears is too sophisticated a computer for the average person. Programming is a highly underappreciated art. For instance, I gave you the suggestion to drum your fingers a while ago. You can stop now. Number three clasped his hands, irate, to stop the absent-minded gesture. I told you a million times to stop doing this. Number eight, it is completely unacceptable. No need to get upset, the latter mollified him, just proving a point. So, you postulate we're vacant conveyances which allow meaningful content, autonomous and indifferent to its vehicle, to flow freely inside the collective consciousness. What's new about that? Find me something new in this our existence and I'll worship you as a god. Who are you people? Gwen finally recovered her wits, too shocked by the chicken rearing slash weed smoking slash philosophy debating composite to react sooner. Case in point. Number seven gestured squarely in her direction, presenting her to the group like one would an exhibit to the jury during a court trial. Meaning is better conveyed through those who aren't aware of it, through whom it can flow and altered, like portends through an oracle. The awareness of the oracle, their personality, only impedes the message. We are the library, number four answered her question. You mean the librarians, Gwen mumbled, too insecure to raise her voice. Speak up. Number one commended her, stern. 
Don't you mean you are the librarians? Another bout of laughter followed, which amplified Gwen's insecurity to epic levels. When it subsided, number seven looked straight into her eyes and asked, What do you think about meaning? She asked, unsure. No, about the courtship rituals of dung beetles. Of course, about meaning. What do you think? I don't suppose I have an opinion. Gwen hesitated. Why are you here, then? Why are you here? Joining a group discussion about meaning if you have nothing to contribute. You're stepping all over your argument. Number one shifted the attention from poor Gwen back to the center, earning her undying gratitude. You postulated she is conveying meaning even more so because she isn't aware of it. And what meaning would that be? Pray tell. For one, she asked us who we were. That is a fundamental philosophical question. You know full well that's not what she meant to ask. And this is where you contradict yourself. It doesn't matter what she thought she was asking. It matters what she did ask. I want you to eat my shoe. Number seven stated proudly, What do you think the higher meaning of that phrase is, gentlemen, rules? Number four intervened. The mandatory five minutes of silence were observed before the debate resumed. Some people would run straight into the desert and devote the rest of their lives to whichever god they thought wrote that poem on the seashore and commanded the sea to deliver it to them. If that's not a supernatural event, I don't know what is. Number six stated, That pretty much explains you lot. Gwen kept her thoughts to herself to avoid further public scolding. If you have the guts to think it, you better have the guts to say it. Number one stared her down. What exempts you from that misunderstanding of numinous experience you blanketed on the rest of us? You are here. Why are you here? I don't know. Gwen raised her voice out of frustration. Ah, the group engaged in contorted swaying, as if suddenly crushed by unbearable pain. The decibels, the decibels, they jumped to their feet and started stomping the ground in a strange primitive dance, while Gwen watched them, in disbelief, suddenly thrown out of normal reality and into whatever here fate or God or the laws of probability had devised for her. Forget about the cascade failure of meaning the current conversation was working so hard to unleash. One could jump down from turtle back to turtle back forever given enough time and libations. The question was still valid. Why was she here? Maybe we can help you with that. Number five said. Maybe we can help you with that. The choir repeated. Why is she here? Number four asked. Why does she need a reason? Number three answered. Therefore, the question is invalid. The choir responded. The question is not invalid. I really care. It matters to me. Gwen asserted herself, eyes welling up with tears. So your question is valid because you said so. Number seven replied. That kind of makes sense, actually. Meaning derived via individual decree that presupposes the existence of free will. I thought you didn't believe in that. Belief implies conviction in the absence of evidence. I know there is no free will. Then your proposition is moot, number six offered. If she has no free will, she cannot make her own meaning. I'm right here. Gwen wanted to scream, but she worried that would trigger another decibel dance. So she kept to herself. The debate continued long into the night, animated at times, occasionally tentative, flowing around Gwen's non-interacting consciousness like rushing waters diverted by an inconveniently placed boulder. She eventually spied a jar within arm's length, reached out for it as inconspicuously as possible, and took a generous gulp of its contents. So, say there is a higher power. Number five resumed the previous premise. What then? There is no higher power. Number eight replied. Let's pretend we existed in a place where there was such a power. What flows from that? This is the most preposterous hypothetical. Just admit you have no peg to hang that object on. What object? The higher power. Yes. 
That's because it doesn't exist. Nothing doesn't exist either, and yet you have a peg for it. Okay, I'll play. If there was such a power, it would have very little influence on whether meaning is autonomous or derived from individual experience. How do you figure? A cat crosses the street. The cat doesn't question whether it wants to cross the street or why. I can scare it into crossing the street. But then I am just another variable in the enormous set of externalities which directs its actions. What if you pick up the cat and take it to the other side of the street without asking for its input? A hawk can do that. Or a strong wind. Poor cat. Gwen thought and took another gulp of the glimmering liquid. The moon was high in the sky and its light reflected in the clear brew made it flash wildly like living mercury. This sight, combined with the familiar burn in her stomach, made her feel like she was drinking liquid fire. I'm not in Kansas anymore, she whispered softly, almost against her will. Somebody is putting her literary knowledge to good use. Good for you. One down, several million to go. Smoke, the number on her left offered. No, thank you. I'm drinking with numbers, she thought. I'm drinking fire with numbers. I wonder what is the meaning of that. The campfire was dying and its embers played strange games with her sight painting clear and vivid stories which made her wonder what other ingredients had made their way into that barrel in the desert.